I want to jump back to our notes, and I do apologize. I'll have copies next week. I should have made notes tonight. I thought about it, and that's what happened. I thought about it, and, and it was gone. We've been looking at, um, in fact, tonight, most of I'm going to share is not necessarily your notes. So um, we've been talking about a call to worship. We've been talking about sacrifice in our worship. Um, that worship does not depend upon how we feel. Uh, we can be, we can feel defeated. We can feel sick. We can feel tired. Um, but we need to pray anyway. I pr praise God anyway. Um, Jacob, when he was dying, the Bible says that uh, he, uh, he blessed both uh, 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 the sons of Joseph and he worshiped leaning upon the top of his staff. Hebrews 11, 21 says, can you imagine here you are dying, you are tired. I'm not talking about living in an age where we have morphine and we have uh, uh, palliative services uh, uh, that, that, that makes death comfortable, but there he was dying but yet he was worshiping God. Amen. It doesn't depend upon how we feel. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, we may be betrayed. We may be physically, emotionally, mentally, financially, or even spiritually exhausted. But God wants us to praise Him. Amen. Uh, uh, he doesn't want us to complain. He wants us to worship. And so there is sacrifice in our worship. Uh, we, we find that the Old Testament gives us a standard of worship that, that, that involved the death of something. And uh, animals that were, uh, uh, that were to be sacrificed were not animals that they just randomly grabbed out of the field, but many of these were lambs, they were sheep that were pets. They were something that there was sentimental attachment to. You may look back and you may say, man, in the old days they didn't get attached to pet pets. How are we any different than them? And if you ever have a dog or a cat and uh, maybe whatever your animal is, and if you're, uh, I remember uh, I, when I was a senior, I, I, I tutored for the fifth grade teacher. He had this great big old black snake in an aquarium. He had it for a couple of years. I was tutored for my junior, my senior year. I did not share the same fondness for snakes that he did. Uh, there was no attachment at all to snakes. And uh, lo and behold, the heat went off uh, there in the classroom. And uh, the snake uh, got too cold and it died because there was no place for it to keep itself warm. And uh, that teacher, he was in his 50s, I remember him being tearful. But he was attached, you know, it was his pet. And so when we look at sacrifices, uh, uh, we find that, that, that there is the word itself, sacrifice. As we bring to God, true worshipers know how to sacrifice. And so Paul and Silas, they were in prison, but yet they were worshiping God. Do you think it was because they physically felt like it? Or maybe, and, and, and maybe they were spiritually in a good frame of mind. I don't know. They had been beaten. Uh, they had been uh, wrongly done. They were in prison. You know, uh, the things were not on their side. Sometimes we think that we live by our feelings. But we do not live by our feelings. God has called us to worship even when we don't feel like it. Can you imagine what Abraham felt like when he took his only son Isaac and God commanded him, the son and I must go yonder and worship? Here he is. He doesn't know what God is going to do. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. Maybe there was expectancy. Maybe there was still in the back of his mind. Maybe God will allow him to die. God will raise him up from the dead. I don't care. Even if you see your child raised up from the dead, who wants to go through the anguish of seeing their loss? So anyway, we look at it, there was a sacrifice that was involved there. But God wants us to live our sacrifice. And anything that He asks of us, He wants us to give to Him. And so we've been talking about our bodies being a living sacrifice. It doesn't mean that it's easy to worship. It doesn't mean that what we do for God on a daily basis always comes easy. Anywhere you get in life, it's never easy. 
the job that you have, uh, the, 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 the work that you do, none of it is ever easy. There are sacrifices that are involved in it, but in the end it pays off. And so God has called us to a life of sacrificial worship. And, and, and we've been talking about how that even in our life, even in our dress, even in the things that we do, needs to be a sacrifice of worship to God. We can't trust our feelings. We can't trust our hearts. Amen. Our hearts are desperately wicked. Our hearts are, are deceiving. But one thing that we can trust is the authority of God's Word. And God calls us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so it brings me to a point tonight that I want to talk about for a few moments. And I want to invite you together in as we talk about sacrificial worship, and let's talk about when we worship, it's because our life has become something that God's called us to, and we must do as believers, and we must be sanctified. So before we can even get to the specifics of how God wants us to live in our life, We've talked about our life being a living sacrifice, our attitude. We've talked about even um, uh, our, our, our dress is worship to God. Where does it all start? It all starts with sanctification. Now, what does sanctification mean in the Word of God? We're going to look at that. Let me just share a few things, and we're going to look at the Word of God. We'll look at some Scripture, because beyond anything I say, the authority of God's Word is the premise by which we live. We need to live sanctified. And our sanctified life is a type of, is, is worship to God. So sanctification, it's two things. And we've talked about this before. But let me reiterate this. It is positional and it is uh, instantaneous. It is practical and it is progressive. So when we are when we are saved, there is uh, there are some folks who talk about something that is called a second definite work. Have you ever heard anyone talk about a second definite work? And many of these folks, when they talk about a second definite work, you know, we believe in the indwelling of the Spirit of God with the evidence of speaking other tongues, and that is consistent with what the Book of Acts, throughout the Book of Acts, is all about. We find that when, 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 when uh, believers are questioned, have you received the power since you believe? Have you been filled with the Spirit of God? Have you been baptized with the Holy Ghost? You'll find that. But we didn't know that there was any other baptism besides John's baptism. So this baptism that is being spoken of uh, 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 on a consistency throughout the book of Acts, it is the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which when we look at that, there is a work of being filled with the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in other tongues from the, from the day of Pentecost on throughout the book of Acts. Now some folks teach and believe, and particularly the Wesleyan Methodists, you'll find them, there'll be other groups that believe in a second definite work, which they believe that they are sanctified, that they are, they, they reach this moment of sanctification. I believe that if you're around them any period of time, you'll find out that they have not reached that second definite work of sanctification. But it is progressive, and that we, we, uh, I don't know if the word is grow, I, I don't know if, uh, uh, we 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 we, uh, we progress in sanctification, and so uh, that second definite work. Uh, we know that the first work is justification. It, it's talking about the cleansing through the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, we use that word justification. An easy way to remember it is God looks at us just as if I've never sinned, and so that is the washing of our soul uh, with the blood of Jesus Christ where He reasons with us and though our skin sins be as scarlet, they are now white as snow. And so uh, the, 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 there is justification, but then there is sanctification. And uh, sanctification, uh, a, a person uh, may be saved uh, or justified without ever being sanctified. Do you know that you can be saved and never be sanctified? 
I know some folks that they've gotten saved, but a work of sanctification has never happened in their heart and in their life. And may I say that if you aren't sanctified, that if that second work of sanctification never happens in you, I don't believe that you're going to be able to hold to the work of justification. So there is a work of salvation, but then there is a work of sanctification. And so uh, uh, the, we, we find that the New Testament uh, Apostle Paul, he addresses believers as all saints. And then in that same book, as he writes it in 1 Chronicles, uh, you can read 1 Chronicles 1, verse number 2. I'll, I'll actually turn there. Or 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Actually, it is Chronicles. Paul refers to them as being saints. And then he goes on and he begins to address their carnality. So if they are saints, and then he goes on to address their carnality, he's addressing that they are saints, but they are in need of sanctification. So if we are saved, does that mean that all of a sudden our carnality is eradicated from us? How many of you, don't raise your hands, how many of you, have, since you have become saved and you know that you're saved, you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, you've confessed your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive you your sins, and then you find that you're struggling with maybe some unclean thoughts, some unclean thoughts towards someone, maybe you're dealing with loss, maybe you're dealing with some temptations that are ungodly. Does it mean that you're not saved because you're struggling with this? It means that this is an opportunity for the Spirit of God to be able to sanctify you. They were saints and were sanctified in Christ, but they were living far from the daily conduct that Christ had called them to. So in our life, if we're going to worship, we're going to have to live a sanctified life. Someone look at First Chronicles 1, verse number 2, and then someone look at First. what's it? Yes, I'm sorry, it's Corinthians. I said it right, I looked at it. And wrote it down wrong. Someone look up 1 Corinthians 1, 2. And then 2. Okay, so I'm going to read 1 Chronicles 1, 2, and then we're going to read verse chapter number 3, verse number 1. So I'm going to have 1, 2, 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Unto the church of the God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to the saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus, of Jesus Christ our Lord, with theirs and so Paul addresses them and he says to the church, and he says, you are sanctified in Christ Jesus. And then he said, call to be saints. So everyone who is found in Jesus Christ, you are called to be a saint. Every one of us here are called to be a saint. What does that mean? It means we're called to be holy, it means that we're called to be sanctified. So he addresses them and he says, all of you are saints. Now when you look at the church, and if Paul was here today, and he began to look around the church and he says, to the saints of America, we're about the church. And some of you may be rolling around and say, well, they're not a saint. Well, they're called to be a saint. And they were saved. And so God washes them and cleanses them. But let's read chapter number 3, verse number 1. Someone read that. Thy brethren could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, 
even as unto babes in Christ. Wow! Do you hear what he says? He said, I, 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 I can't speak unto you as being spiritual. You just call me a saint. And now you're saying you can't call me spiritual. You're calling me carnal? He says you're babes in Christ. That's why we're challenged to grow in Christ. Not to just always want the milk of the Word, but get into the meat of the Word. That God calls us to spiritual maturity. You know what that is? That is a life of sanctification. And so, verse number 2, he says, I have fed you with, with milk and not with meat. Well, why did he fed them with milk and not with meat? Because they were carnal. Because you're not able to bear it, neither are you now able. I know this is a very, very elementary, and most of you have probably heard this, but you know, we don't go to, uh, we don't go to uh, the table and, and, and pick up a baby bottle of milk and drink it. No, some of us, probably all of us here, then I don't think we have any baby bottles here anymore. All of us go and we eat something that is <coughs> more palatable to our taste, that brings more substance to our body. We have grown past that of a baby bottle. But unfortunately, Paul is saying, some of you, you have to be fed like a baby because you've never progressed. You know, sometimes in the church, this is really, really going to be terrible to say. You want to talk about worship? You know what the best worship we can give to God is? Grow up. <laughs> it is. We have to grow up. And so we have to get past that, that milk, and we have to get to the meat. And some people are never able to get to the meat because they're carnal. Their minds are completely carnal. If you're struggling with why don't I understand the depth of God's Word, or why am I not progressing farther, do you know why it probably is? Is because you are full of carnality. God wants you to grow, and God wants to sanctify you, and your greatest act of worship to God can be that you grow in His grace and His knowledge, and you allow sanctification to become a part of your life. Because if you don't get sanctified, I'm concerned that you're going to lose your justification. You're going to lose your salvation. You can't live being carnal. Verse number 7. So then neither is he who plants anything, neither is he that waters, but God who gives the increase. God wants us to increase in our life. And the greatest act of worship that we can give Him is that we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Amen. We are growing in His grace and His knowledge, and we roll ourselves in sanctification. We are saints, but we are also allowing ourselves to grow into this sainthood, if you would. Amen. And we're allowing sanctification to become a part of our everyday life. In verse number now he who plants and he who waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. It's our choice if we're going to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, and we're going to allow sanctification to become an active part of our life. We are saints, amen, but we are to be sanctified in Christ. So it's practical and it's progressive. Amen. Uh, 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 it's the position of the saints, but it's also the position where we start in the beginning and we go. Everything in life is about a go. I've said this to you before. We have a God who's on the go. We don't have a God who's stagnant, but we have a God who's on the move. And so we used to sing that song, the move is on, my brother, the move is on. God is on the move. And if we are going to live a life of worship to God, we've got to be on the move and we've got to get with Him and we've got to roll in this, this thing called sanctification. So brother, just even as you said, if I may use you as an illustration, you said about what, what, what you've given up for God in this past week. That's awesome. You know what that's a mark of? That's a mark of sanctification in your life. That God is working and moving in you. But God should be working and moving in every one of us. Because we should be being conformed to the image of God. He's the only one who can enable us 
to live a sacrificed life. I told you, I, I, I struggle as I think about this. I don't know that we really grow in sanctification because growing is kind of being in a place and you just go up. I think it's not necessarily a growing, but it's a progressing. We move. We move in it. And so um, we progress in sanctification. Sanctification is both absolute and progressive. Someone read Hebrews 10, 14. Hebrews 10, 14. <laughs> So the Word of God says that by one offering, by one offering, He has perfected forever them who are sanctified. So there is a work of sanctification by one offering. In the Old Testament, when Moses sanctified the priesthood, it wasn't multiple different offerings. It was one offering by by the anointing of water and by the blood. There was one. And really, Moses is a type of Jesus Christ, even in the Old Testament, when we look at him. Because Jesus Christ in the New Testament becomes the one, by one offering on the cross, who sanctifies us. By one offering. He did one, one work on the cross, and he sanctified us. And so, uh, uh, as we look, in, in a sense, he's done it once and for all, but then it's progressive. In Hebrews 12, just a few pages over, and 12, verse number 14, someone read that. Hebrews 12, verse number 14. So we're to follow, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So it is a progressive work, but yet it is a continual work because we allow holiness, sanctification to be a part of our life. It's, it's progressive. It's a consecration. It is a cleansing. Why do we talk so much in, 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 in a Christian walk about consecration? Because in that consecration, we are taking ourselves back to that place of sanctification. We have to do it continually. Life is, is revolving and life is progressing. Amen. And as it does, we have to make sure that we are in the place of sanctification. We're facing new things today that we've never faced before. Well, our, our, our age is a factor of it. Uh, the world around us is a factor of it. I, mean, I have to be honest. So I, I'm at this wedding this this weekend, and, and I'm realizing I'm so different than a generation that's 20 years younger than me. So, so different. And they're doing things and facing things I've never, ever, ever faced. I'm not even going to go into all the specifics. But it, it's just... It's, it's, it's the progression of things. We are going to have to progress. But in our progression, things change. The only thing that's constant in life is God change. But we have to visit that place of consecration. We have to visit that place where we are holy before God and we sanctify ourselves. Once again, positional, and it is practical. Um, we are defined by it when a sinner is radically changed into a holy worshiper. Can I say that again? It begins when a sinner is transformed into a holy worshiper. So sanctification is part of our worship. When we look at the word sanctify, what does it mean? Holy what is set around the throne of grace as John gives us the glimpse into heaven? What is constantly being set around the throne of grace, the throne of God? Holy, holy, holy. So this whole thing of worship revolves down to a very fact in our life that we need to live holy and that we have to progress in this thing called, called holiness and sanctification. Yes, it is positional and it is practical, but it is also progressive as we grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. There are things about our, our, our life in 1 Corinthians. Let me turn back there again. 
I'm sorry I know I'm bouncing from Scripture to Scripture, but I'm trying to give you Scripture tonight to back up the things that I'm saying to you. 1 Corinthians 3, verse number 3, the Bible says, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envies and stripes and divisions, and, 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 and you are not, uh, 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 are you not carnal, and walk as men? Uh, he said. He said this. He said, I, I, "I challenge you to get out of your carnality." When we see things in our life that is carnal, it's a challenge to us as an act of worship to God to put off carnality and robe ourselves in the righteousness of Christ. Paul was saying to them, you're not living up to your God-given position. When we're saying that God save us to carnality, God saves us from carnality. So when we are saved, He calls us to abstain from carnality. What are the things in our life? Well, He, he told them, there's envy, are we envious of things? Are we envious of someone? What are the strifes in our life? The things that cause the friction, the strife, that God doesn't want that to be there. But God has called us to follow peace with all men. So what are the things that's causing us to lack peace in our life that we're not exemplifying worship to God? And we're not worshiping God because we've not surrendered that to God. All of us. I'm saying me. I'm saying you. God has called us to progressive walk of sanctification. And so we are in Colossians 3, 3, 1 Peter 1.15, 1 Peter 1, 2, 2, 5. We are exhorted to mortify or to make dead those carnal things that are in us that we may live in Christ. Romans chapter number 8 is all about walking in the Spirit. So there's a part of worship. We, we can think that worship is coming in. And remember when we started our series of worship, I said worship in our society has been about the, 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 the individual coming in, and they worship, they raise their hands, they sway, the music makes them feel good, and music does make us feel good. I mean, how many before you ever found yourself tapping your feet or snapping your fingers or humming along because the melody catches you and just puts you in a good mood? I mean, there are songs out there that does that, right? Or maybe you think about maybe a song that makes you think about the one that you love and makes your heart even more fond of them. There, there are songs out there like that, right? Uh, 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 however that is, you think about that. Music can do that. And our worship has been geared more on music and more about folks feeling good than what it is about a call to sanctification and living a life that is in the Spirit and mortifies and eradicates the things of the flesh. Real worship is about uh, 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 saying, I'm killing this carnality. I'm getting rid of it. And I'm living a sanctified life. I'm progressing in Christ. So we have been divinely appointed to live a life of sanctification through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Ghost, and through the power of the Word of God. See, when Jesus died upon the cross, in a sense, just as Moses sanctified those Levitical people, God calls us to a life of sanctification through His work upon the cross. Something interesting I wanted to say, let me just get my thoughts together here. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But it's not the cross that gives us our victory. That's just an emblem. But it's the work of the cross. And Jesus did not die a sinner's death. Jesus took upon him the sins of the world and he said, it is finished. I bore the sins. He did not die a sinner's death. 
he died victorious, doing the will of the Father. So our victory and our sanctification comes from the blood of Jesus Christ and claiming the work that he did upon the cross. You may say, Brother Seville, I struggle with this. I struggle with these carnal thoughts. I struggle with this attitude. I struggle inside. Do you know what your victory is? It's by, it comes by being purged by the blood of Jesus Christ. By letting the blood of Jesus Christ get to those areas and eradicating those areas of our life where we die to them. I'm no longer going to have a hateful spirit. I'm no longer going to be a tail bearer. I'm no longer going to have envy and strife. I'm no longer going to long after the things of the world. I'm no longer going to want to dress like the world and act like the world. I'm no longer going to be committed to carnal things and pleasing the flesh more than pleasing God. Really, that's what it boils down to. The Spirit of God allows us to be sanctified. Putting off the old man and putting on the new man. Sanctification is is an appointment with the blood of Jesus Christ. I skipped something in my notes and I want to say it next time. So when we look at the doctrine of sanctification, it all starts in the Old Testament when we look at the word holy. God called a holy people. So separation, holy, is a description of the divine nature of God. And it represents all that God is. God is not earthly. God is not human. God is divine and God is holy. And God has called us to put on His nature. So that means that He has called us to a holy nature. God has always had things that have been set apart to be holy. Think about this for a moment. Didn't God call Israel to be a holy nation? They were His people. He called them to be holy. And the, 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 uh, the, uh, the Levites, they were to be a holy priesthood. We're not a priesthood. The Bible says that when we are saved, we are a royal priesthood. God has, has always called for a day a week to be holy. The Sabbath is to be holy. Do you ever look at, there are feasts, in, 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 if you ever talk to someone who is Jewish and they live by the Old Testament, and so you can learn a lot about the Old Testament from these Jewish people, there are things that, that, that are very holy, uh, various feasts uh, that they had. When we think of Passover, it was a very holy time. So God, what is God's, and what God is always called to be His, has always been called to be holy. And so if we are the people of God, God as well calls us to be holy. If we say that we are labeled and we are God's, then God has called us to be holy. He called, has called us to be a holy people. He's called us to be a peculiar people. So in, in, in being that holy and peculiar people, we need to live a life of sanctification. And I'm telling you, it's greater than anything that we can, uh, can conjure up in our mind, that we can come in and we can sing songs and we can sing them beautifully and, and just right. We can lift our hands and we can close our eyes. And, and whatever our form of worship is in our mind, if we don't have a sanctification, the final life, then we miss real worship to God. Because God calls us to a holy worship. I want to challenge us 
for the next five days to Sunday, what are the things that we struggle with in our life that are common? It's good for us to evaluate it because it is a progression. You may not even, there may be things that you've never taken care of from years ago that God's helping you with. Maybe you pushed them in the corner, but God says, I want to sanctify you. It's time to get them out of the corner. But maybe there's things that on this journey of life and this walk with Christ that you've allowed to come into your life that you need to eradicate, that you need to mortify, and you need to sanctify. And when you do it, when you do it, it's our highest act of worship to God. Because sanctification is holy. And holy is worship. the challenge to us as one worshipers. Does anyone have anything they want to say tonight? Well, I'll throw this out. The importance of sanctification because